Hello there, it's Christy, and we are continuing on with my doctoral thesis. In the last video, we heard about the stages of development of the questions that were being set up for the data set to test some of the theories that I've outlined in Chapter 1 and also using the measures that were described in Chapter 2. And in this next section, I will be describing how I um, how I selected the measures I did in order to put into the, the main survey, including some of the statistical analyses conducted in order to evaluate the measures to find the most appropriate ones for statistical analysis. Testing and selecting the measures. In the testing wave of the survey, all of the questions listed by Ward et al. were included in the survey questionnaire and then tested. See Appendix A. The pretest questions in Survey A were administered to members of the YouGov panel between the 5th and 7th of November, with a total of 361 people responding to the A version of the pretest survey. As was mentioned in the previous chapter, Helmrich, Spence, and Willem used a sample of high school students and college students and parents and found that their internal consistency reliabilities, Cronbach's alpha, for the M scale ranged from 0.67 to 0.78 for males, high school students, college students, and parents, and from 0.71 to 0.77 for females from the same group. For the F scale, their Cronbach's alpha ranged from 0.72 to 0.80 for males, and from 0.73 to 0.79 for females. The MF ranged from an alpha of 0.53 to 0.6061, and from uh, 0.61 to 0.65 for males and females, respectively. According to Pallant, the recommended score on the Cronbach's alpha coefficient should be equal to or higher than 0.7, which was achieved for both men and women's masculine and feminine measures. To, attest, to assess my data for internal consistency with the internet responses, a scale reliability test was conducted using SPSS on the test wave data. Analysis of my agency measures produced a Cronbach's alpha of 0.81 on 7 items, above the recommended 0.5 for scales of less than 10 items. Based on the results of my analysis, removing any particular item did not change the scale reliability. According to the item total statistic, statistics, the Cronbach's alpha for the scale would range between 0.80 and 0.77 if any one item were deleted. The measures of communion produced a Cronbach's alpha of 0.84 on six items. Again, eliminating any one particular item did not improve the scale. The range of Cronbach's alpha when removing the various questions ranged from 0.83 to 0.80. Our emotional vulnerability scale obtained a Cronbach's alpha of 0.70, but this is but in this instance, removing the measure indifferent to others' approval reduced the alpha to 0.61. This information was incorporated into the item selection decision. The second point of concern related to the relationship between sex and gender. We examined the distribution for each response by sex using cross-tabulation. To test the relationship, we selected those questions that were statistically significant in their association with a predicted biological sex. In other words, we were careful to incorporate agency measures that were associated with men and communion measures that were associated with women. If the survey did not use gender measures that were the most conservative and rigorous, that is to say, if they did not do a good job in predicting the respondent's sex, the findings could be criticized as employing improperly specified measures. The results of the cross-tabulation analysis, the gamma, are presented below in Table 3.1. The table presents the results of the chi-square chi test of independence and the ordinal measure of association, the gamma. Items that produced a negative gamma, for example, not at all competitive, negative 0.31, indicate measures that predicted more men than women at the extreme positive end of the scale. Positive values of gamma, for instance, not aware of others' feelings, 0.28, or never cries, 0.42, indicate that more women answered in the extreme positive end of the scale. The questions selected for use in our internet study, three measures of agency, communion, and emotional vulnerability, are listed in bold in Table 3.1. Our internet survey was administered to 6,000 members of the YouGov panel between the 30th of January and the 5th of February 2007. In total, 2,890 people responded to the survey. 
After the data were collected, it was necessary to analyze the gender measures. Analysis was run on the variables included in the main survey, the variables that are used to construct scales employed in the subsequent analysis. Scale analysis of the agency questions on the main survey variables produced a Cronbach's alpha, alpha of 0 0.60 on three items, while the measures of communion produced a Cronbach's alpha of 0 0.80 on three items. Both were above the 0.5 score often recommended for scales of less than 10 items. The emotional vulnerability measures produced a Cronbach's alpha of 0.495 on three items, which falls just below the Pallant recommendation, recommended 0.5 threshold. However, as it is common to find low Cronbach's alpha with small scales, an alternative evaluative measure can be used, the intermean correlation. Briggs and Cheek recommend an inter-item correlation range between 0.2 and 0.4. The inter-item correlation for the EMV scale ranges from 0.22 to 0.29 within the recommended range. In addition, principal component factor analysis was conducted on the variables to further test their internal reliability. The results of this are displayed in Table 3.2. Factor analysis shows that there are three separate loadings for the variables using a 0.5 cutoff. Given the results of the analysis, these variables are suitable for use as scales in statistical analysis. I'm just going to pause here to go up to the table. So this shows the summary statistics derived from the conducting cross uh, tabulation between the 18 items measuring gender and biological sex. And this tells you that for each measure, the negative ones means men scored higher, the positive ones mean women score higher. And you can see here the ones that we selected to use are bolded. Now occasionally you might find like this one not very understanding of others' feelings and where you guys have not helpful to others and that has a slightly lower gamma. So you would say, why did you pick this one um, not at all understanding over helpful to others? And in those cases, the distribution of the variable was less skewed. So there was more opportunity for variation of uh, responses on that distribution. And so it was it was chosen as a better measure. And I think that's pretty much um, all you really need to say about this. These are the nine questions. And I will also be going through, um, here I can do the factor analysis a little bit. The information here shows the Cronbach's alpha score. And Cronbach's Kron alpha is one way of evaluating whether or not a series of questions kind of are go together. Let me give you an example. If you have a questionnaire about people's taste in music and you have on there top 40, classic rock, opera, um, sort of classical music, jazz, and R&B, what you might find is that people who say that they like opera also tend to like classical music. And what you're, you're picking up there is a preference for that type of music. Another example from that might be people who like jazz might also like R&B. And again, it's, you're, you're picking up in that case, in this hypothetical, a, a, like a, a sort of an underlying thing that connects both jazz and R&B, just like the, there's an underlying thing that connects opera and classical music, and people who like one are also more likely than other people to like the other. So what we're trying to pick up with uh, principal components analysis is the latent variable. Since we can't measure agency directly, we have to get at it by asking questions about things that relate to agency, like competitiveness or self-confidence. And we're trying to use these more direct measures to get at the latent measures underneath it. What you want to see in a principal components analysis are the questions that are um, separated out by their latent constructs, in this case agency, communion, and emotional vulnerability, each having their own loading, each having their own factor that they are loading on, that they correlate with each other, they don't correlate with the other measures. And that's what principal components analysis allows you to explore, and that's what this next section is going to talk about. Um, <clears throat> I think, yes, yes, a little bit. Okay. As an initial test of the main question of this thesis, is sex an appropriate proxy measure for gender, a further factor analysis was conducted, this time adding a dichotomous sex variable. The results are presented in Table 3.3. .3. 
as the results indicate, sex loads in the predicted direction on each of the three factors. Men were coded as zero and women as one, with a positive score for communion and emotional vulnerability, a low score indicates low emotional vulnerability, and a negative score on measures of agency. However, the loadings, 0.3 for communion, negative 0.41 for agency, and 0.44 for emotional vulnerability, are well below the usual point five cutoff, suggesting that agency, communion, and emotional vul vulnerability, although correlated with sex, are distinctly differentiated from it. So here, kind of the same logic, if sex was highly correlated, we would see that it would score in similar range to the other elements of this latent construct, but because they don't score as high, they don't load onto the factor as the three measures of the latent construct are loading, we can say that there's that sex is not a part of this factor loading, that it's separate from it. So back to the, the, the uh, thesis. As it was also my intention to evaluate the three gender measures as distinct concepts, a further principal components analysis based on the structure identified in Table 3.2 was conducted on the scale items without the inclusion of the sex variable. This time, a Veramax rotation was used to reduce the possibility of cross-loadings and saving the factor scores as separate variables. These results were saved as regression variables and are used throughout the analysis in this and subsequent chapters. The use of the PAQ gender measures as interval rather than categorical measures is discussed further in the next section. Finally, to confirm the association between the gender measures to predict biological sex in the main survey, another cross-tabulation analysis was conducted on the main survey data. The results are displayed in Table 3.4. In line with the results above, each of the measures predicts sex in the appropriate direction. There is a relationship between being male and having a high sense of agency and being a woman and having a high sense of communion and emotional vulnerability. And each measure is statistically significant at p equals less than 0 0.001. Gender measures, interval or categorical variables. In the literature review of chapter two, the variables for agency, communion, and emotional vulnerability were discussed as if they were scale measures. However, this is not how the original personal attributes questionnaire measures were applied. In this section, I will review the original methodology for the PAQ, as well as the justification for using these measures as interval instead of categorical measures, and review a recent publication that uses two of the three measures employed in this thesis. Spence and Helmrich found significant differences between the arithmetic means of men and women, leading them to use a median split method for joint classification of respondents. Spence and Helmrich classified individuals in the sample based upon, quote, the rounded mead, sorry, the rounded mean of the medians of the males and females in the high school group sample. The mean of the medians for the two sexes was used rather than the median of the total sample because of the unequal number of males and females. Spence and Helmrich used a sample population of 715 American college students. They admit their findings have, quote, almost exclusively been obtained from college students in the United States, individuals who tend to be homogeneous in age and socioeconomic background, coming, mostly coming from homes in which the parents are upper class and college trained, unquote. Their study created a scale for each of the three gender measures, which ranged from 0 to 32, and in their results produced median scores of 20 for the M scale and 23 for the F scale. However, Spence and Helmrich acknowledged the drawbacks of their own methodology related to the classification of those who fall at or near the median. They found that the joint distribution for females and males on each of the PAQ scales was essentially normal, and due to the small possible range of scores on each of the eight item scales, the response categories, it will be recalled, are distributed along a five point scale, a considerable number of respondent scores were clustered around the median. However, the researchers also reported that in the populations for which they had multiple samples, there was stability of means and medians, and they found no marked differences between populations of non-selected individuals. Unlike the results above, my data did not produce statistically significant sorry, did not produce significant differences between the arithmetic mean of men and women on each scale. 
This proved problematic, as there was no obvious way to assign an individual to the masculine category as opposed to the androgynous. Further, adopting the median score as a cutoff point, although probably quite sensible in the 1970s when this initial study was conducted, appears to have been an arbitrary choice led by convenience rather than, than informed by either appropriate statistical tests or theory. Instead of replicating the median split of Spence and Helmreich, I decided to use the variables produced by the PAQ measures as scale rather than converting the scores on these scales into categorical measures. There are sound theoretical and methodological reasons for doing so. First, theoretically, many studies have employed the PAQ measures for concepts other than masculinity and femininity. PAQ measures have been used to analyze, study, or measure agency, communion, and also to measure instrumental or expressive traits. Therefore, I am not confined to assigning individuals to categories of masculine, feminine, androgynous, or undifferentiated. As I argued in the previous chapter, the focus of this thesis is those psychological perspectives or dispositions which are associated with one sex more than the other, not traits which belong exclusively to one sex. From a theoretical point of view, if it is true that men and women possess varying levels of agency, communion, and emotional vulnerability, then it seems appropriate to include all these variables and to include the variation on the scales in the analysis. This seems the best method to understand when and how agency, communion, and or emotional vulnerability have a relationship with the dependent variable in question. Further, Spence and Helmrich used the PAQ measures of emotional vulnerability as a layer to the 2 by 2 M and F scales, complicating matters by incorporating the emotional vulnerability median split method into categorical analysis. Not only would there be the four traditional categories of masculine, feminine, androgynous, and undifferentiated, but by employing a median split method for high and low emotional vulnerability, the number of possible categories expands to eight, with a high and low EMV category for each of the four genders produced by the M and F scales. Even with an N of 3,000 cases, there is a possibility that one of the 2 by 2 by 2 cells would lack enough valid cases pr to produce reliable results. Methodologically, it makes sense to use the gender scales as interval level variables instead of categorical. Interval level variables simply contain more information to be analyzed than categorical variables. A recent publication has used the measures of agency and communion as interval level variables and found results indicating that the inclusion of the gender measures as interval level variables provides separate pieces of information. Given the amount of information which could be lost by simply arbitrarily assigning an individual to a gender category, both in terms of the method of statistical analysis and the accompanying loss of information informed by the theoretical implications of a result, it seems the most appropriate course of action is to treat the measures of agency, communion, and emotional vulnerability as interval level variables. To replicate the work of Spence and Helmrich, correlation analysis was run on the measures. As mentioned in the previous chapter, Spence and Helmrich examined the correlations in the MF scales to determine whether gender was a bipolar measure. If gender was most appropriately measured on a bipolar scale, then the higher scores in the M scale should produce a negative correlation with the F scale. What they found, however, was that correlations between the M and F scale were not only low but positive in both men and women. This low correlation between scales of masculinity and femininity was also reported by BEM using the BEM sex role inventory measures. My bivariate correlation analysis of the gender scales from the main survey dataset produces identical results displayed in Table 3.7. If masculine or agentic traits were at one end of a single spectrum, spectrum and feminine or communal traits at the other, one would expect a negative relationship between the variables. In other words, the more masculine a person scored, the less feminine they would be. The positive correlation score suggests that individuals with high masculine traits tend to score higher, not lower, on feminine traits. This is more evidence that gender is a more complicated phenomenon than the simple binary of sex, which is often used in the social science analysis, and that separate measures are needed in order to estimate the relationship between these gender measures and political attitudes and behaviors. In Chapter 1, a quote from Carol Tavis was cited, quote, 
Unlike essentialist theories, which regard gender as the independent variable, if I know whether you are a man or a woman, I can predict how aggressive you are, constructionist approaches regard gender as the dependent variable. Constructionists want to know what factors predict how we come to define ourselves, labor ourselves, and behave as a man, a woman, or something else. Using this constructionist framework, the next section examines the results of analysis that use gender as the dependent variable. I use the various demographic variables which were included in our survey, such as sex, age, marital status, etc., and employed ordinary least squares regression to evaluate which measures are related to an individual's gender score. OLS has several advantages when the dependent variable is measured as a continuous scale, as it is with the three dimensions of gender, agency, communion, emotional vulnerability, that are employed here. As Pallant notes, ordinary least squares regression allows a more sophisticated exploration of the interrelationship amongst a set of variables. It allows a researcher to ascertain, one, how well a set of variables is able to predict an outcome, two, which variable within the set of the variables is the best predictor, and three, whether a particular variable is able to predict an outcome while controlling for the effects of other variables. To better understand agency, communion, and emotional vulnerability, the regression factor variable for each gender category is analyzed using the demographic measures variables in our data set as independent variables. Tables 3.9, .10, and .11 display results based upon the main survey data. The independent variables used in the, ana the analysis, as well as their coding, are listed in Table 3.8. And here are the independent variables that I've used. We've got sex, age and years, young man, ed education, age at which they ended their education, whether they're in a couple, whether they're a parent, if they have a self-identified religious identification, whether there's some, other, some interaction effects I'll talk about a little bit later, income per year, whether or not they're in full-time employment, what their class sort of schema is, and whether or not they have a mortgage. So getting back to the text. Preliminary analyses were performed on the dependent variables to ensure no violations of the assumption of normality or linearity were violated. The results indicated that the measures of agency, communion, and emotional vulnerability are normally distributed and linear. Additional analyses were performed on the independent variables set to ensure no violations of multicollinearity or heteroscedasticity. Each independent variable in the model had a tolerance score above 0 0.10 and a VIF score below 10 as recommended by Pallant. As Table 3.9 indicates, sex contributes most to the variance in agency amongst the independent variables in this model. The beta was negative 0.23. The next two most important explanatory variables are related to employment, beta 0.12, which indicates that the more status, more status one's job has, the greater an individual's sense of their own agency. The third largest contributing variable is income, beta equals 0 0.10, which indicates that the higher one's income is, the higher one's sense of agency. Each of these measures is highly statistically significant, p equals less than 0 0.001. Important for the main research question of this thesis is the amount of variance which can be explained. The reported adjusted R-square indicates only 8% of the variance in an individual sense of uh, individual's agency score can be accounted for by the variables in the model. Despite the fact that sex is the most powerful explanatory variable in the set, it does not account for the substantial amount of variance, which suggests, suggests that it is inappropriate to use as a, a, a measure of a biological sex if concepts being tested are gender. Campbell notes that small sex differences or cohort differences can be washed out in data analysis. OLS was run on a split sample based on the coding of a respondent's sex in order to 1. Evaluate whether or not there were different structures underlying men and women's sense of agency, and 2. Compare the results to determine whether there were any sex differences in how gendered perspectives are influenced. The analysis on the dependent agency variable using the split sample method resulted in similar structures excepting age cohort, which was statistically significant for men but not for women, and having a high status job, which was more statistically significant for women than men. My own initial descriptive analysis of the agency measures, not reviewed due to space constraints, showed that younger men had much higher levels of agency than older men, which may be the reason why Spence and Helmrich's homogeneous group of undergraduates showed marked differences between young men and women's median agency scores, while my own analysis produced comparable medians.
I therefore created an interaction effect for the youngest cohort of men, 18 to 25. One of the American gender gap theories about women's growing autonomy predicts that women who are most autonomous from men are the most different from men in their attitudes. I created a measure to capture the interaction effect for those women in the highest two classes of employment to test whether high status employment has a unique additional effect on a woman's sense of agency. Women who indicated they were employed as a manager or senior administrator or in professional or higher, te higher technical work coded 7 and 8 respectively in Table 3.8 above. The results of Table 3.10 indicate that in this exploratory dataset, an individual's sense of agency is influenced by whether or not they are a male or female, with females having an overall lower sense of their own agency, beta equals negative 0.21. Males aged 18 to 25 have a much higher sense of their own agency than other respondents, beta 0.08. This model showed that the higher one's income, the higher one's sense of agency, beta equals 1.10, and the higher status of one's job, the higher sense of their agency, beta equals 0 0.10. There is a specific interaction effect for women who are in high status managerial and professional work, beta equals 0 0.07, which increases their sense of agency. However, similar to the analysis above, this model only accounts for 9% of the variance in respondents' agency scores. The analysis of the data confirms that sex is only weakly related to the psychological measures of gender. Table 3.11 examines which independent demographic variables best predict an individual score on the communion factor variable and provides additional support for the conclusion that sex is not an adequate proxy for the concept of gender. As the table indicates, there are only two measures that achieve the minimum cutoff for statistical significance, and the variables themselves only produce an adjusted R-square of 4%. Among the demographic variables included in the model, sex is the best predictor for an individual's communion score, with women having a higher sense of communion, communion than men, beta equals 0.19. Age is less significant, although older people did have a higher sense of communion than younger people, beta equals 0.09. This finding is repeated in later analyses, in which both the age variables are related to an individual score on measures of equality, and both sex and age are related to higher scores on measures of kindness. See Chapter 5, Tables 5.10 and 5.11. Analysis, analysis on the factor variable for emotional vulnerability, Table 3.12, shows that the largest contributor to the variation in an individual's emotional vulnerability is their sex, with re women reporting higher levels of emotional vulnerability than men, beta equals 0.24. Next, the results suggest that the older one gets, the less emotionally vulnerable one rates oneself, beta equals negative 1.7, and that the effect of a parenthood is also likely to make people less emotionally vulnerable, beta equals point, negative 0.05. One seeming paradox suggested by these results, at least for the respondents in this exploratory data set, the older one becomes, the higher one's sense of communion, the higher one's sense of communion becomes, while simultaneously one's sense of emotional vulnerability decreases. Whether this is a cohort or a life cycle effect cannot be determined using a one-off cross-sectional sample and raises another question for long-term analysis of the role of gendered perspectives in political science and psychology. As with previous findings, these demographic variables, including sex, can only account for a small amount of the variance with an adjusted R of 0 0.08. As limited as these demographic models are, the amount of variance explained by the independent variables in the model range from between 4 and 8 percent. They do point to the differences which underlie agency, communion, and emotional vulnerability. These results suggest that one sense of agency is related to their employment and income in a way in which an individual sense of communion and emotional vulnerability are not. Further, these analyses demonstrate that while sex is a powerful predictor of an individual's gender perspective, we cannot use sex and it assume it captures the gender components of men and women's attitudes. Conclusion this chapter has reviewed the research strategy that I employed to measure and incorporate psychological measures of gender into an exploratory data set designed to better understand the contribution of sex and gender. The overall three-stage three research design was outlined, along with the processes by which the measures were selected. The use of the scales as interval variables, as opposed to categorical variables, was justified on theoretical and methodological grounds.
The subsets of gender measures were evaluated for their reliability, and the selected measures were analyzed with both principal components analysis and ordinary least squares analysis. The, both, the results of both types of analyses indicate that although biological sex is related to gender, it is only weakly associated, demonstrated both by principal components analysis and ordinary least squares regression. Although sex was the best predictor of gender in ordinary least squares analysis, it only explains a very small proportion of the variance in gender scores. Finally, regression analysis suggests that agency is a more complicated psychological phenomenon that can be influenced by sex, age, income, and job status in a way which is unlike the explanatory demographic variables which account for the variance in communion or emotional vulnerability. However, the analyses above only point to the underlying contributors to an individual's gender perspective. This analysis cannot tell us whether or not gender is important over and above the explanatory contributions made by the sex variable in statistical analysis. If a social scientist were interested in investigating the role of sex and gender and explaining political attitudes and behaviors, an idealized research design can be envisaged. To truly establish causal links, one would need to be able to clearly define gender norms for a particular society, then to study how those gender norms were transmitted to individuals in that society. Further, the social scientist would then want to evaluate the extent and degree to which any one individual had internalized these gender norms and measure how strongly or weakly he or she possessed them. Armed with this knowledge, the investigator could go on to evaluate the role of these gender factors in political attitudes and behaviors. Unfortunately, I cannot engage in the first half of this idealized research design. Therefore, I must confine my empirical investigations to the second half and attempt to approximate the ideal research design, to use measures associated with masculinity, femininity, and emotional vulnerability, and assess the extent to which they change or have no effect on the significance of the sex variable. To evaluate the explanatory value of these gender measures in political science, these new measures must be included within models of political behavior and attitudes. The next two chapters will examine, respectively, the explanatory value of gender and sex as independent variables in the analysis of political behavior, specifically intention to vote and vote choice and political attitudes. All right, guys, that is it. And if you are always, you're still listening all the way to the end, you are a total geek and a nerd, and I love you for that. And we are going to pick this up next time with Chapter 4, which is the first use of statistical analyses to evaluate the explanatory power of the biological measures as compared with the gendered measures that I have derived from the personal attributes questionnaire. So until... Um, you and I get our geek on next time. I've been Christy. You've been awesome. Thanks for listening and watching. And um, if you want to, um, I guess I could, uh, well, the thesis is available online. But if I scroll through any of the tables too fast, just tell me in the comments. And um, maybe I can add some screenshots uh, of that when I'm talking over. Maybe I'll just do that when I'm editing the video to allow you to see the tables more clearly. All right, guys, thanks for your time and attention. Bye.